uh, Joe recently uh, uh, passed her, uh, what we call here the Viva, so the defense, and joined the club uh, of those who have suffered that. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> welcome to present uh, your uh, research today, open, open for whom? Open educational practice with indigenous workforce development and learners. So floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks very much, Paco. And hello to everybody who is joining us or watching uh, my YouTube today. I wanted to first and foremost uh, pay my respects to all the traditional owners and elders of the lands on which we are meeting and working. Um, the elders I've been blessed to work with and very fortunate to learn from, um, with, uh, with whom they've shared a lot of um, beautiful, strong um, lessons with me that I hope to help keep transforming my learning and my work. So I um, want to acknowledge that I'm on Larrakia country right now here in sunny Darwin. Um, and this is my local beach that I go for walks on with my friends and dogs. You can see it's very crowded in this photo. I mean that literally. <laughs> That's a busy day. So first and foremost, I also wanted to um, just acknowledge my positioning before I get started. Um, I, uh, I acknowledge that I am not an Indigenous person working in this space and so I've been very careful throughout the last eight years working here uh, and learning with and from um, my Indigenous uh, colleagues and seniors that um, I have a particular interest in um, this type of work and by no means do I speak for Indigenous people or uh, assume to know what's right or better. Uh, what I'm trying to achieve with my work is to increase um, the beneficial aspects and the functional and healthy relationships that um, Western institutional work can um, do and keep working towards in, um, in the very long road to uh, reconciliation. So I just needed to put that um, very clearly at the front of my presentation. Um, okay, so uh, where I'm coming from is here in the Northern Territory in Australia. You'll see the map of Australia here. And I'm at the very uh, top coast. We call it the top end. Um, the statistics uh, I've listed here are missing one particular thing, which is that uh, this population of 250,000 in the Northern Territory um, there's about 30 million in Australia, not, not quite just yet, but there's only 250,000 people in the space of, you know, this, you know, one and a half million square kilometers, 30% of which are indigenous, whereas the rest of Australia, um, overall indigenous population is about 3%. So we have straight, um, straight away, quite an interesting demographic. Here in the top end, we also have another 30% of people who were born overseas, um, international community. So very small community, but very uh, diverse. This uh, demographer, Simon's uh, tweet here, really caught my eye this year, um, which was showing the Northern Territory um, as not uh, achieving the same life expectancy as some of the more uh, wealthier economies, so to speak, and so I've just listed a, um, a few of the other regions that it has in common uh, economically as well as life expectancy. Um, there might have been a bit of conflation in that article, but the link is there for you to read. In Australia, we have a remoteness score. Um, cities are scored zero to two, and remote regions such as Northern Territory are uh, scored up to 15 and where I am is about 12 to 15. So most of the areas where these resources that I have, um, this research I've, I've done is based on the, the very high remoteness score. 30% of which have no internet or even basic telephony. Um, most of the remote communities have a payphone, uh, one payphone in the center of town. Um, employment participation for indigenous and Torres Strait Islander, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the Northern Territory is 37%, and that's roughly half of the non-Indigenous um, population. And I have the Australian Bureau of Statistics link for that right here, just in case you are interested. 
Um, moving on, just thought I'd look that up again this, um, this evening. We also had a, an issue with some very draconian um, policies. Hi, Maha. <laughs> um, uh, called the Northern Territory Emergency Response, where um, most of the remote communities in the Northern Territory were kind of taken over by um, federal police and um, management, uh, you know, community managers uh, in response to an alleged um, increase in uh, child abuse. Um, and so there was this, there's been a kind of a real history over, over the history of the Northern Territory, even though it was not at all similar to the history of Tasmania or Victoria or New South Wales, for example, in terms of colonial practices. But the, the legacy of uh, colonialism lives on in uh, a number of policies and practices in the Northern Territory, um, with it being an annex to um, the rest of Australia. So it, it was it's not a state, it's a territory. And uh, so therefore it kind of um, has very unique um, political makeup. There was also a bilingual schooling area in the 70s where a lot of wonderful work was happening in these remote communities. The teacher linguists would travel uh, and work in these places and then produce bilingual materials. And there was a really strong movement for um, almost two decades and then it was axed. And um, now a lot of remote students have to travel to town being Catherine, Tennant Creek, or um, Darwin, or Alice Springs, um, down the center of the territory there, to attend boarding school um, after primary school. And then um, even further down to Adelaide in South Australia uh, for the really, um, yeah, so for other options. So uh, we've got a very particular set of complexities um, that uh, indigenous population in the territory is facing in terms of um, access to education, healthcare, basic infrastructures, as well as um, participation in self-sustainability. So one of the projects that I worked on at the Northern Institute at Charles Darwin Uni, when I first started there, um, was the fisheries project. And this was one of the senior leaders, um, senior Aboriginal leaders of the project wanted to make sure that any learning project met these principles for de uh, development. Um, and these are really important for uh, very particular situation specific reasons. And these are, you know, <laughs> in a very contentious uh, policy area, such as fisheries in this part of the world, um, it's, you know, the, the commercial fisheries is really big, as well as the um, recreational fisheries. So these are, these are quite, um, these are called primary industries here. And um, so for you know, indigenous senior members of that uh, sector and um, stakeholder groups to have a voice. These are some pretty um, interesting and crucial points that we needed to ensure um, were embedded in, in the resources we developed for that project. Now I'm flagging that because you'll see later on in my findings section um, <clears throat> that uh, some of these may um, look familiar and overlap with uh, a lot of what we've tried to do. So an introduction to the projects. Make sure I'm following my notes. Um, now the reason this is an open educational practice, you might be wondering, I'm not using perfectly defined and contained open education resources and not getting into the definition um, conversation too deeply. But um, these are a selection of resources, platforms, and um, I guess frameworks and tools, models um, that came out of the, the various uh, social policy projects that we worked on in the last eight years. Um, so traveling clockwise on your screen, the top one here is Jurwir, which is uh, a project I did with one of my um, supervisors. Uh, Dr. Kathy Gutajaka. She's. Um, you may have. Uh, you may listen or, or or read a bit more about that in my thesis if you really want. She's an amazing, amazing person here in the territory, and she's done so much for education and many other things. Um, but Judwear is uh, 
the Yolngu Mata name for the great bowerbird. And this is a page on the actual bowerbird platform, which is a kind of a Facebook for biodiversity geeks, um, where it's crowdsourced biodiversity information and you can populate each of the um, cells and fields and share it with other people and they can comment and it's segregated up into the Atlas of Living Australia. So it's a citizen science project and we were using it as a pilot for remote indigenous rangers to be able to record um, flora and fauna that they see on their country um, when they are working. Um, to the right, you'll see there um, uh, the protecting the community. This is one of 17 or 18 different digital magazines that we produced for the pre-vet project in the vet sector in Australia is vocational, educational and training. You may, um, um, uh, the trades or the um, TAFE or the vocational sector. Um, so uh, this was aimed at middle school students. Um, however, lots of other schools and sectors found it useful for professional development um, training as well. Um, this was, a, was an interesting project because the problem with this one was that it opened up a dialogue about employment with indigenous population in the Northern Territory, um, which hadn't really existed before. As you saw, the, the policies before um, were uh, not really open and uh, to, to that kind of thing happening. And so Prevet kind of provided a platform whereby the discussion about employment was validated by indigenous role models, such as um, the one you see here um, on the front cover of this magazine. Down at the bottom to the Indigenous Fisheries Training Framework. Again, this is all openly available uh, videos and resources, but there were some videos that we actually made with people out on their sea country doing uh, fisheries and aquaculture um, jobs that were technical and scientifically valid and supported by other stakeholders in the, in the sector and were narrated in their language of their choice. Some of these people speak five languages. So um, that was kind of open in that way. But the problem with that was that it's in a very contentious policy field, such as jewelware and the next um, and final resource, which was the Aboriginal Indigenous Engagement Model. This was one of three, one that was done in New Zealand and another one that's being completed in Indonesia as well as part of a biosecurity project. Um, so pairing with um, the Jewelrier project of um, the kind of Facebook for biodiversity, the, the engagement model was also a way to increase biosecurity's bureaucrats and um, uh, science workers um, with skills to um, understand ways to discuss and engage with local community members who actually have traditional authority and ownership over those those tracts of land that they enter to protect Australia's very rare and uh, precious biosphere. So the, the problems with those aren't necessarily license-bound definitions of open, but you'll see that they engage with kind of how people experience open from the user's perspective or the knowledge holder's perspective and how the interface between Western technology and workforce development, and science and fisheries and these types of things affect um, how open can be practiced. So therefore, the problem was for me to figure out how to find that uh, more functional pathway towards experiencing openness in a way that wasn't necessarily exploitative or continuing to do this colonization of knowledge um, many people working and living in, in remote communities and in indigenous communities have the experience ongoing of white fellows from town coming in on an airplane, dropping in the parachute in and I'll do a consultation with my clipboard and I'll fly out and I've engaged with community and um, inserting Western knowledge into a, a incredibly ancient <laughs> and traditionally embedded and complex situation. So to make some of the educational practices that we're trying to achieve through these resources more functionally successful, I had to discover a little bit about what that might actually look like from how we could explore it from within a Western context. Um, 
what is open about the resources, how are they used in these contexts, and what are successful outcomes for those OEP. And the interesting thing about that is that, you know, who defines that and what matters. So I had to be very careful about where I was positioning that and I had to weave through a lot of um, different levels of awareness that I did my best to do. So in order to do that, I just started reading. <laughs> And a lot of the uh, knowledge authority um, that I've spoken about is threaded throughout my thesis. Um, knowledge authority is a term that is used here to refer to the traditional authority that people hold as a result of the very complex and embodied um, kinship structures and um, <laughs> relationships that they have across different communities and uh, within their families structures and it's something that you know is very hard to get a uh, western head around and so the more you learn about this stuff the the less you know um, and that's a really um, confronting place for western academics and teachers to, to find themselves but it's a very rewarding place to to get a little bit of that epistemological humility that uh I think someone at the Festival of Learning was talking about. So it was a really an, um, important to spend a bit of time looking at that and understanding what knowledge authority meant and how we can continue to practice education in Western context with the respect for the knowledge authority of people who hold knowledge that we're not familiar with, but also with learners that we want to engage with. Um, Freire's pedagogy of oppression uh, was something that really struck me as a really, well, critical pedagogy kind of stalwart, but also um, this uh, acknowledgement of cultural backgrounds being very important. We need to do um, education programs with a partnership, not for or to people. So that really struck me as something that I had seen and, and experienced and um, reflected on a lot when I was doing a lot of the work and learning over the last eight years um, with various groups. Um, then I engaged with a bit of Habermas and the theory of communicative action and the uh, way to establish a kind of an understanding between parties having a conversation. And this kind of helped me understand that, you know, the, the importance of language, especially here, um, people have historically had multiple languages, languages embodied in the land and their relationship to it. Um, language is something that isn't just a spoken thing. That is, <laughs> I've written about that in the latest issue of Jime, if you're interested, with, with uh, Gutha, and um, talk a little bit about the justice about um, acknowledging the language aspects of our resources. But the ability to have a communicative action has understanding at various levels via validity claims. So I explored a little bit about what that meant and um, I wrote some validity claims um, based on the rest of the theories, such as situated uh, learning and communities of practice, learning on country. And that's another term you might hear a lot of me saying community and country is a very um, colloquial um, use um, here in the territory, when you're on country, you're on a specific group's country. So I'm on Larrakia country, or I'm on Yolo country, or I'm on Waramiri country. Um, so there's lots of different country that you can acknowledge in that way of speaking. Um, but also that learning on country, I started to look at the competences in 21st century learning, which has been a real kind of woo, thing with digital learning. And um, I really started to notice how similar they were. And that learning on country, the things that I'd experienced and my very limited experience of that was very much mapped across and had a lot of alignment to 21st century learning. Um, and so uh, there was a little bit of interest in how we can do that in a digital way with open practices, but also in how we practice our pedagogy more generally. And through validity claims and the, that context embedded language um, and language use and the situated uh, practice and learning on country, we can address things like whoop, the, <laughs> oh, what happened there? <laughs> 
the digital sphere. So that was another thing about Habermas was the digital sphere and um, and how that made uh, a bit of sense with how communication gets pathologized in uh, one way digital publications. So there's a cultural interface there with Nakata and that transactional distance as well that could end up being transformative or even transcendent. So I got really deep into the theory there. Moving right along, that really informed um, the validity claims that I wrote and came out with a language use focus and a situated learning focus and then the public sphere focus and how we kind of can zoom out on that. I'm on time too, look at that. And um, pardon me, and uh, how we can zoom out and understand how if we do these kind of particular things, not exhaustive uh, of course, but if we pay attention to a couple of those situation specific things that Habermas is saying is really uh, critical to understanding and developing communication, then we can um, occupy a special kind of space there and, and give and seed some digital territory and give space for more kind of uh, room for different kinds of knowledge authority and um, authorization. Okay, so uh, after that, I realized I can't just use validity claims. So I went through and did a bunch of reading on decolonizing criteria. Um, that were specific to uh, working with indigenous knowledges, not just, you know, Habermas. <laughs> so I, of course, went to Smith um, uh, decolonizing methodologies, and I um, chose some of the keywords from our 25 um, indigenous projects, but I also read for the colonizing projects. So I kind of did an inverse flip, and I tried to, you know, look for things in the resources and tried to find ways to... Um, to see where you know there was still some colonization happening, um, as well as the things that um, Smith listed in the projects, and I also did a mini synthesis of um, decolonizing research um, and research pedagogy um, from the authors here, and I've listed the five kind of positions um, or principles that, um, again, very wordy. <laughs> I apologize. Um, but you know, recentering people, not data, um, and we are redefining and organizing structures that are under that we are we just take for granted in the Western digital design. Um, we engage in in creating learning on country and keeping it there and um, in, impacting directly on its context. This is one of the principles for engaging in indigenous. Um, research here in Australia from my ATSIS is to in, encourage and ensure that uh, the, the research that you do has a direct reciprocal benefit to the communities that you work with. Um, and, and not often do we actually consider that more deeply than a tick or a um, assumption. Um, and even if we ask people, um, we need to find other ways to do that work, I think. So to go deeper into um, understanding what the impact of um, the work we're having is on people, or is it just within the institution? Um, Community-led learning and instruction of researchers. So the researcher becomes the student, and um, the Western research methodology and participation, um, participatory action research, um, becomes that really friction uh, tense place where it's very uncomfortable for the researcher, but it's a really fertile site of knowledge creation. So that was my decolonizing criteria. And then I realized these are resources for education. Uh, so I had to look at different um, ways that evaluation frameworks were using um, and evaluating um, open education in different parts of the world. So here's a list of the ones that I chose. Um, and you'll see that JISC is on there. There's a whole bunch of different themes um, in the toolkit there, but I chose the collaboration beyond higher education and the student experience and produced materials, um, culture and practices. So those are the areas I honed in on. The OER Commons evaluation tool I use because these resources are likely to be used in an educational context, but not specifically. Um, the OER Hub Ethics Framework, thanks to Rob. Um, 
uh, was really helpful in helping me to understand um, the levels of consent and consensus that I was trying to to evaluate, but uh, in the participants that were interviewed and helped author a lot of the resources, um, and who actually did author a lot of the resources. Um, and I was just that glorified camera holder or recorder. So uh, there are also some Northern Territory specific evaluation frameworks that were here from the Fred Hollows Foundation, who's done a lot of work in, in um, remote communities in the Territory and across Northern Australia, especially. And then um, one of my colleagues, Emma Williams, did this two-way accountability and evaluation. So that was a really quite helpful um, two-part um, understanding of things. Also, too, the Commonwealth of Learning has a measuring empowerment tool, which I kind of reduced down to a few different criteria to measure whether or not these social policy research uh, tools that we were using were not just education tools. They were community development and enterprise development and workforce development and science engagement and communication tools, whether or not that was actually helping to do much um, empowerment work with the communities we were working with. <coughs> so going through those three different um, kind of a way to, for me to try and, um, you know, kind of prove to myself that I knew <laughs> I was covering all my bases because this is a very complex set of um, forces that I was trying to, to work with and these, these interfaces between the different kinds of knowledge sectors and industry sectors and all these types of things was really kind of blowing my mind. So I went uh, a little bit nuts with all the different criteria, but I think, you know, the, the pedantry of doing that helped me to see back to the principles from that first project that I talked about at the beginning of, of the, the presentation about respecting senior people's knowledge, about relating to the relevant country. There was a lot of similarities about this in the evaluation framework and the validity claims, as well as the decolonizing criteria. So I was trying to weave that knowledge authority all the way through um, my selection of criteria. Um, and that informed a lot of how we developed the projects along the last eight years. I mean, some of these projects were, were completed early on in, in, in my PhD um, kind of collection phase, but a lot of them were also um, completed in the last few years. So, or in the last couple of years, pardon me. <laughs> I then um, decided to do an, a developmental evaluation because we had a lot of evaluation expertise um, that I had been drawn to. And when I was faced with choosing a method, I thought oh, the critical pedagogy and the situation specific and the particulars that were so um, unique to, my, to the context that I was working in uh, were also really um, kind of intimidating. So um, how was I gonna do that? And my wonderful supervisor, Gupta Jaka, came up with that Langbunga Garmak Watermeri story. Um, and if you, I've given these slides to Paco, but if you look at this picture of the waves here on the slides, I've hyperlinked that to a YouTube clip that they've actually published the story that comes from her family. And her story, very briefly, was that it's a very, very, very old story of her family. And she gave me permission to use it. Um, she always teaches me with stories. And she was talking about water coming down a hill. And um, during the wet season here in the Territory, we get like a meter of rain a <laughs> in the space of two weeks. It's immense, immense amount of water that comes through, floods everything out. And so um, um, in the high stone country in um, Arnhem Land, water flows down and down and down and washes away all the debris. And it breaks through rocks and trees and all the way down. And finally, it's very violent and it pushes away all the rubbish. And that was what her, her message was. Is this, this process is about to filter out all the rubbish. And when it comes to join salt water, it gets calm and it joins a larger body of knowledge. Beautiful. Beautiful and touching and strong analogy that helped me think, I need to filter these resources to find out how to get rid of all the rubbish and help to contribute to something that's a bigger body of knowledge. And so I've looked through a few different evaluation and 
bit of design thinking and design uh, design research and some of the participatory um, evaluation and action research that we've done um, to develop pre-vet. And I came up with a bit of a, a mixture of, of influences that match the situation specifics to the validity claims and the communicative action theory that was really underlying all of my framework, as well as um, the filtering uh, process. So I developed all of those sets of criteria and I um, went through these three processes with those. So I had a series of filters with the validity claims and then I'd interrogated the resources for the colonizing criteria. And then I interrogated them with the evaluation frameworks. And then I did that two more times. So I really put the processes through the ringer. And at the end of each of those stages, um, I then asked questions from the research questions as well. Um, I then went on to the data comparison set where uh, or phase, pardon me, where I gathered lots of the other information from around the outside of the resources. So statistics such as the one on the, on the second slide about understanding the context of where these resources were happening. They're not happening in a really affluent um, area where you know students have lots of other supports around them. There are um, a lot of other things that give a bit of more texture to what's happening in those resources rather than just a video. So you can look at them and you'll say, well, that's just a video. Um, but knowing what happens when a lot of the students in this very small population watch these videos and interact with the resources and the story of employment, for example, isn't one that's very positive, they get to um, see that in a context that's very different. And so the comparison, data comparison part of my methods helped give a bit more context to what was happening with phase A. And then with the, with the data analysis, I went through all the answers. So I wrote all the answers three times, three times, three times. And then I had a look at the comparison data, well, given those answers and this other stuff that was going on, you know, can I still answer those research questions? Um, and then I, I counted and I rated the criteria um, as I pulled out some themes. And then I had um, some discussions with colleagues from each of the projects very briefly. Um, and I just kind of got an idea of at the end of, you know, given these these answers that I have, what do you what do you think of this now that you know I did this little study on this and the, those conversations were really helpful in finalizing the findings, which looked kind of like this. Um, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the lovely little bar charts and spidergrams <laughs> um, because they don't tell the whole story of which criteria were met, um, but the projects that were the most valid, for example, again, getting back to that fisheries project, was the um oh i'm running out of time sorry i'm going too slowly now uh the frdc and the pre-vet project that a lot of the ones that did really well in validity claims were the ones that engaged a lot of different stakeholders so the summary of that the decolonizing um the ones that scored really well on those criteria were the ones that involved a lot of indigenous stakeholders in their development um, some of the anomalies, however, um, was this Bowerbird one, the Jewelware project and the Bowerbird platform. You'll see it didn't score very well. Um, and so that's a really interesting one that I'm gonna keep poking at because it's a really interesting case study of how um, it's a platform, but the way Guta Jaka and I used it and populated it made it particularly decolonizing. But in other ways, it couldn't reach this valid or evaluative way. So that really speaks to the big emphasis and the big lesson that we all try to, to, to try and answer is that um, the, the process of education is some um, at times and the process of this open pedagogy is a lot more important than the platform or the tool or the technology or the boxes that you have to um, populate. So, 
how does this work? So three uh, main findings. I'm going to try and whiz through these as quick as I can because we need to have time for questions and a chat at the end. Um, but three main things. The first one is that how we use language is a major, major thing, um, especially with the historical background of you know indigenous languages in colonized countries and the freedom to speak them and the freedom to um, conserve them. Um, but also to not just a spoken language, but how we make meaning, how we agree on things, what biosecurity might actually mean to um, the old man sitting out on his traditional country on a sacred site, and what it might mean to a big mining company, for example, or a, <laughs> a, a person who's really um, worried about preserving you know, scientific data around species. Now, I'm not saying that those are wholly, um, uh, you know, negative things, but we need to understand the, the, the way that we use language and engage in different conversations, such as the one in pre-vet, uh, pre talking about country and community and using um, it to open a dialogue about something that students never had anybody represent people um, in their community as employed, first and foremost, or what that actually looked like. Uh, for the role models who speak for themselves in those little um, resources there. Jurwir, um, she occupied a lot of space um, with her language and her um, ontology of how biodiversity from her indigenous science um, could be presented on that platform. And the engagement model, you'll see there's a lot of time um, icons on there and that the, the way that language is used in that culturally safe way in that model slows down the Western parachuting and extractive kind of scientific, let me pull out what I need and then carry on with my, with my work project. Um, this uh, stops and gives time to consider and then choose the right time in the right place. So it, it adjusts the timing. It doesn't necessarily slow it down, but adjusts the timing and the, the approaches that are valuable. Um, in how you use language and engage with people. Changing narratives and establishing consent. Uh, the second of the three findings was that the situated practice. This is beautiful video. This is a tour guide uh, cutting up a kangaroo tail. This is something that a lot of the students in the, in the territory would have found familiar. So to see something like that, that these guys are getting paid to do and to discuss um, the, you know, the kind of the skills that they need to do to, to, to teach tourists um, about culture uh, was a really kind of, kind of validating thing. And it was a, in place, like some of the guys there, you know, there's the students in the schools around that region that they work in, they're related. So they're like, that's my cousin. And that, that was quite cool for a lot of students to see. Um, but then these boxes here, these drop down boxes, um, these were kind of a little bit more prescriptive. Like for example, there's one down there about traditional stories. Um, and you know, Guta never overpopulated that box. She never shared traditional stories about any of the sightings or bio, um, biodiversity sightings or items that she shared. She just shared the names and how they got used. So to assume that um, traditional stories should be shared in a, in a, in a space like this, um, kind of ignores that that situated um, understanding of knowledge authority and how we're going to use um, this technical space to, um, to claim digital territory for knowledge and language needs to kind of be, I think, thought about a little bit more carefully um, there. So, um, but also the video here, Umoku Narmir is another principle of engagement. And so it wasn't just those steps to engaging with indigenous people that were listed on the on the model, but it was also you do these steps, but you have to think about it in this way. And that Gumokunamir is about um, operating with your heart, heart to heart with a, with another person. So forming a relationship with the people that you're working with. Um, on a on a level that's really quite real. Um, so uh the finally two these authored uh videos were these are you know where people have been 
growing oysters and for harvesting tree pang, uh, sea cucumber for hundreds and hundreds of years. And so for these, um, fellas out here to do their uh, water testing videos in their own language on the country that it belongs to their families and they're organized who gets to work on what what job on the island um, that's really quite situated um, and that reclaims a lot of digital territory finally the um, cultural interface now Nakata talks about that as being uh, places where two cultures meet and how you operate and interact in that space is really how um, you can I don't know kind of you know practice and respect knowledge authority a bit more and make space for it in the Western um, institutional context especially but also to avoid that pathologizing of communication so there's Bettina, she's uh, my Yapa, my sister, and she's the Aboriginal uh, community police officer um, on Gallowinkle in Arnhem Land. And she, um, she's so many amazing things. She's not just the Yapo out there. She, uh, she runs a women's center with a bunch of other women and um, she's a community champion of the year. And she's just done so many amazing things, but also within her community too, she's got a lot of very special roles and she's just an amazing person and so she operates in that cultural interface she works in that space but she also has um, so she really embodies that that work um, and and models it for other people who 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 watch her um, so the way that she did that on that pre-vet video that she was uh, she authored was to speak directly to students that she knew were going to um, be interacting with the resources. So that was what we tried to do when we developed Prevet was to try and really speak to students and not just have it um, open a dialogue and transcend what was going on when they were sitting in the classroom um, experiencing Western education. Um, the jewelry uh, cell here, this is something that Gutta did every single time. She kind of occupied this space for the taxonomy for um, which clan the species belong to. And I found that to be really powerful. I also wrote about that in the Jime article um, published a couple months ago. So have a look at that if you really want to go into something about how she, um, she really transcended uh, the use of that resource and that platform there. And then the um, engagement model also um, developed a instructional tool and um, advice for biosecurity workers. And so it's kind of really flipped that education model of um, you know scientists from the government coming into community and telling people what to do because it's about biosecurity. It's a very kind of militant uh, language that's being used. They actually call it peacetime and incursions of pests and these sorts of things. And rightly so, we wanna protect beautiful nature here in Australia. Um, but that also meant that the kind of relationships formed weren't always partnerships. And so that project in particular really transcended that relationship and flipped the power dynamics and um, practiced knowledge authority. And then down below is the statement about the resources. Um, again, they weren't proper OER licenses, but because people that authored those videos out on the fisheries project chose that license given um, the descriptions of all the different uh, creative commons licenses they wanted to be able to share their work with other people but not have it changed or or exploited for money of course um because i think they have um, from a particular ontological background and cultural background, um, there's been enough extraction of Indigenous knowledge for Western gain. And so that kind of discusses how the cultural interface can, can act um, between Western institutional education and technology and Indigenous knowledge systems that have been around for tens and tens of thousands and thousands of years. Okay, so getting right along. Um, I've found the three main theory statements around transforming the digital cultural interface, um, understanding situated praxis and recentering humans, <laughs> and um, uh, in, a, in a way to kind of 
keep working at expanding how we do the work to develop more understanding and use different ways of managing language and communication um, with people that we work with to try um, to keep improving uh, the quality of how we create and manage and work with knowledge um, across different cultures. So those are the ones in bold. I've got some theoretical principles um, under each of those that I won't read out to you, but I also have some practical principles in my discussion chapter in my thesis that I <laughs> am happy for you to read. Um, and here is the link. And um, that's it. So whew, got through it. <laughs> I'm happy to discuss anything with uh, with anyone that has any questions. I know there's only three people in the room at the moment, but I, I have said that I will take questions on ooh, Twitter. Jeez, there's nine. <laughs> I got nine notifications. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone's. Um... Well, first of all, thank you very much, Joe. Uh, it's quite impressive to summarize a PSD in uh, only 45 minutes with all the things you have done. And uh, honestly, uh, thank you very much. Uh, please. Uh, yeah, it's like, it hurts. <laughs> is there any question? I, I, I just wondering what's, I mean, what are you planning to do next? So uh, I think there is quite a lot to think about on, on next steps from your research. Have you already thought mm. of what you would like to do in the near future? Um, well, I think something to do with expanding on those very broad, wordy theory statements that I came up with. I mean, I feel like when I was looking at them and trying to build this presentation, and of course my OE Global uh, submission as well, I kind of got, oh, that's so wordy. <laughs> it's just so academic speaky. And um, I wanted to kind of keep working on diluting and, and making them more specific, but also come up with a bit more of a practical uh, practic more practical framework or kind of toolkit, but that kind of, I don't want to extract it so much to, from the actual context specific mm -hmm. part of it. Um, one thing I'd really like to do is keep exploring that jewelry project that just keeps giving. Every time I look at it, I realize what Kathy with the Jaka did, or Gutha did, um, she did something different um, at so many different levels. Every, every time I look at it, I realize another layer to what she's done there. So um, the lesson of how we actually use technology rather than focus on the actual technology itself or the resource itself, I really want to keep pushing in that area, even though it's really difficult. But um, I think that's where, um, when I've taken some of these uh, lessons and applied them to my teaching, um, first year you know, students I've got <laughs> this year, um, it's worked really well. And students really feel seen. They feel like they're understood, and you know, um, their context and their background is um, respected. And um, I can't speak for all of them, but from the feedback that I do get from them, they they're really um, happy with that. So it's worked in a very immediate way for me to advance my practice as a, as a lecturer. But I'd really like to work more towards getting um, deeper into how we can do this stuff online and really increase the real deep quality of how we can humanize that digital space for us again, especially with the talk of how online learning is so rubbish nowadays. <laughs> well, indeed, it's very, very relevant in the sense that, uh, um, I mean, my research was, uh, was about accessibility and we realized how important uh, is nowadays to have a uh, um, accessible and content that uh, fulfills uh, diverse populations and uh, diverse needs. So, and, and the current situation, how technology is playing in such an important role in our day-to-day -day life. So, definitely, it's something to consider. Yeah, yeah, it's um, well. I mean, this is it. Like a lot of those students who are living out in the you know in the middle of the territory. Um, I never had a discussion with them that no one really had talked to them very much about what, you know, would you like to have a job after school? <laughs> what, 
what are you going to do when you leave school? Because the the reality of of you know the poverty levels and the and the uh, disenfranchisement and the lack of services, it, you know, it's not it's it's actually not a priority. Like getting your belly fed is a priority for a lot of these students. Still, sadly, um, you know. So I mean, like you know, having a choice of a career or a pathway is also a very Western assumption too. So that's something that's very interesting to explore what work might actually look like because you can't talk to the oldest living culture on the planet about work and survival <laughs> without kind of acknowledging that you're coming from a very Western ideal of economics and capitalist participation. Yeah, that's why participatory research approaches are relevant on power. Uh, co-creation and co-design so yeah definitely um i did i did get some some i don't know if they're tweets questions but no <laughs> people can feel free, I, I can't yeah people feel free to um send me a, a whatever a message or a, a have a chat with me over twitter or we can have an, more conversations there's not many of us again, so um, if anyone wants to watch this, and then I'll be watching my Twitter and inbox me. <laughs> Happy to yeah. chat from my funny little corner of the world. I'm gonna copy your Twitter uh, handler in here. Yes, do. Thank you. I hope I, correct, I copy the correct one. <laughs> well. Yes. Uh, so thank you again. I uh, think it was oh. very uh, interesting talk. And as uh, we said before, uh, we have quite a lot of things coming on the next months, and we keep on in touch. So again, thank you, Joe. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Leo did ask a question. Sorry. OK. Do you think oh, your research I missed that is one, sorry. Sorry, sorry, Leo. <laughs> um, do you think your research is making change in your institution? I really really hope it is I you know in my in my little corner of where I'm practicing it is and in my college I know that my assistant dean and my dean uh, really appreciate how I'm um, adjusting um, teaching and learning in that space for our students um, I've learned a lot from the research center that I worked in which was part of the college the Northern Institute I've learned a lot through uh, through working there first um, but I think like a lot of institutions, I'm just learning um, how pockets have survived in different ways and how pockets interact. And I really, uh, I, I think I entered into it like in a quite naive way because I try and make sure that the relevance of what, I, what I'm teaching makes sense to students. And so I'm hoping to be able to make a meta um, adjustment to the curriculum that we're developing for students that are, are taking units across the university. I'm really hoping to, to, to take that relevance and situated practice and language use to speak directly to students who want to uh, engage in some of the learning that we do in the College of Indigenous Futures where I work. Um, However, you may have seen that there's some changes afoot in the Australian higher education funding for humanities units. So there is going to be some interesting watching this space place <laughs> uh, for that. Um, so is, as you all know, you know, in, institutionally speaking, Western um, uh, higher education uh, has been undergoing a bunch of changes. So. Um, I'm just trying to work with the students, I think. I think I've, I've started to learn that I'm, you know, I don't want to try and push too hard um, when everyone's had so much change to deal with. And um, so I'm starting small. I hope that's answering your question. Leo is typing. I wonder if he could speak up. Yeah, there's a lot going on around us. Um, yeah. Thank you for the question, Leo. Thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to you, Joe. And, well, 
see you uh, soon in the next event. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thanks happy so penguins and um, happy Canada Day <laughs> and happy Territory Day. <laughs>